So welcome everyone to the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Congenital Heart Surgery Database monthly webinar. Today is Tuesday, October the 18th. So thank you everyone for joining today. Um, on the call with me today, let's see here from the STS side, we have myself and Chastity Wellness um, and Melinda Offer, our two consultants. We also have Leslie from the core group. We have Dr. Meyer, um, our surgeon um, on the call today, as well as from our Acubia team, we have Melanie on. So thanks everyone for joining today. Um, just a brief, super brief STS update. I'll, um, I don't have any new information from our last call on the 4th, um, but again, I'll just review that information for anyone that was not able to join. Um, a brief AQO update, um, then we'll turn things over to Chastity for our education portion, and then um, as usual, we'll finish things up with your user feedback and questions. If you have questions, um, please submit those via the Q&A function and also we do have the raise hand um, enabled um, function enabled so just be sure your microphone is enabled if you um, want to chat with us. All right so let's go ahead and hop in to our STS updates. Um, again nothing new from our last call the October training manual was posted um, so that is available and out for your review. The 2022 harvest, again, that harvest did close on September the 16th. Um, just a friendly reminder that that harvest analysis um, will include the updated stat scores. Um, so that analysis will implement the updated stat scores. That analysis report will include a reporting period of July 1, 2018 through 6.30 of 2022. Um, again, that data is currently in analysis, and we are expected to have those results um, available to you all um, in December. So um, that information, again, we are hoping to have um, for you in December. And as soon as we get more clarification on an exact date, I'll, of course, I'll update you all accordingly um, on um, upcoming webinars. Um, with that being said, the 2023 harvest is currently underway. Um, as we stated um, on our previous call, we'll be back to our regular schedule. We'll have a spring um, 23 harvest and a fall 23 harvest. Carol and I are working on those um, harvest close dates and the 2023 harvest um, schedule will be posted um, very soon. Um, so again, we'll have that um, coming shortly. Um, just know that we'll be back on our regular schedule as we were, you know, previously. Um, I think the spring harvest closed sometime in March, I believe. Um, so just um, that updated schedule will be coming out very soon. Um, the spring 23 reporting period will include the um, time frame of July of, excuse me, January 1, 2019 through December 31st of 2022. And the fall 23 reporting period will include July 1, 2019 through June 30th of 2023. Also, um, as indicated on the last call, the data version 6.23, um, that go live date is scheduled for July 1 of 2023. Um, as you all are aware, AQO is coming next week. Um, we'll be in Rhode Island, the 26th through the 28th, we'll be in Providence. Um, for those of you that are um, joining us in person, we are looking forward to seeing you there. Um, just to let you know, the virtual platform does go live tomorrow on Wednesday the 19th, so um, you can access on-demand content, start taking a look at on-demand presentations, reviewing those, um, but again, the virtual platform does go live tomorrow um, on the 19th, and I'm sure STS will be sending out a communication to everyone um, once the platform is live. Um, again, just a reminder, the uh, congenital session is scheduled for Friday the 28th. Um, if you are joining us in person, if you have not yet reserved your room, of course, we encourage you to do so. Um, that um, special AQO rate of 259 is guaranteed through today, Tuesday, the October 18th. So again, we encourage you to get that room scheduled um, as soon as possible. Also, just another friendly reminder that AQO is going green this year. So if you are a paper person and you like to have uh, the data collection form or specs or anything like that um, with you, um, we do encourage you to print those out beforehand and bring along with you. Um, as AQO is going green, we will not have, um, we will not have those uh, materials available um, at registration for you to um, pick up a copy. So again, just be sure and print um, any of those materials um, and bring along with you. 
so that's all that I have. Um, next up, I'm just going to turn things over to Chastity for our um, uh, education session. So Chastity. Great. Thank you, Leanne. So um, I just want to keep today's educational lesson kind of short and sweet. I know we're all going to sit through many um, very exciting um, discussions next week at AQO. And for those of you who will be joining virtually, I know um, the platform, as Leanne said, opens tomorrow. Um, so I didn't want to give you great big long um, presentations today. So I thought we would revisit some FAQs where um, sometimes during months we, we get multiple of the same um, FAQ, so we know it's really important to address. In addition, um, sometimes they're just very important and need to be addressed with everybody. I think too, um, if I can say thank you to everyone on the core group who joins in the calls, and thank you to all of you who submit questions to us. You help us write the definitions or provide the clarifications that are needed. I, you know, we can't alone predict what happens in your program. We only know usually our own programs. And so your questions are really good. And I can't tell you, you know, none of these questions come to the core group and we say, oh, this is a black and white answer. Thank you. You're asking the question because clearly, you know, there's a caveat or it's confused or, or confusing or the way the definition's written, it just doesn't meet your scenario. Um, and that's what happens in the core group too. And we we sit and talk and discuss how our programs would have handled this or does a definition need to be updated? So I know sometimes it can be frustrating that month to month you see things get updated in the training manual and you think, oh no. And I mean, really these are small clarifications because somebody's asked a really difficult question or experienced a scenario that we never anticipated. And so thank you for your questions. Please keep sending them. If what we post is confusing, obviously come back with, with more questions. You are submitting lots of questions, so I appreciate your patience in us getting them out to you as well. Um, so, I mean, we're probably getting 40 to 50 questions, maybe even 60 questions per month. And especially right before harvest closes, we get even more. And so we do our best to answer all of these. Sometimes there's a delay. It's based on the number of questions that you've been asked or how perhaps difficult or complex your question is that it requires more thought. So again, thank you. Thank you for your patience in this process. And we hope that you feel like you're getting very valid answers and that the training manual is making sense. So thank you. Next slide, Leon. thank you. Okay, so first question. The pre-surgical diagnostic cath results a pulmonary vascular resistance of 10.5 wood units times meter squared. And then when they administered 100% oxygen, the PDR dropped to 4.4. So which value should be entered for the pulmonary vascular resistance? So um, again, we received this question multiple times this month. And um, the correct answer is you wanna enter the baseline value of the pulmonary vascular resistance. So in this scenario, this would be 10.5 and not the post-intervention value. So after they um, did something like give nitric or, or give the 100% oxygen. So this will be the baseline value. Obviously we will update this definition because again, it wasn't anything that was, was spelled out in the, the training manual previously. So we will update the training manual and then we will carry this forward to the next version. So you'll see this already spelled out in the definition for 6.23. So thank you for those of you who submitted this question. You'll get a formal answer as well, um, but this was a brand new question. Next. Okay, we received this question and I believe it even came up in the last webinar or perhaps it was on our user group call previously, but the long name of this field is circulatory arrest time, whereas the short name is DHCA, so deep hypothermic circulatory arrest time. What if we are not performing deep hypothermic circulatory arrest in our program at this time? So thank you for to Melinda who pointed out that the adult definition gives a little bit more clarity surrounding this. We will carry this forward to our definition, update this training manual. It will also go then into this field in the version upgrade. But circulatory arrest is the complete cessation of blood flow to the patient. It is a surgical technique that involves pooling the body and stopping the blood circulation. This is different than cardiopulmonary bypass. But what in this field, what we're intending to do, regardless of a long and short name, is to capture any episodes of deep or moderate hypothermic circulatory arrest. So if you are doing circulatory arrest, we want it um, included in this number. Next slide. Explain the intent of this field. It is the date of last follow-up. 
Is it the last known contact with a patient or the date that I worked to find the patient? And so thank you to those of you um, who submitted this question as well. It's something that took on a lot of thought in the core group and even higher. Um, but really, this field is not to capture when a data manager performed a function or did their job. It's really to capture the last known date of contact with the patient. So whether that is through a phone call or whether that is through um, seeing the patient in your EHR that they had some type of appointment you know, within to a provider within your facility, um, somehow you know the date of last contact with the patient. This would also then have to be the, the mortality date of the patient, because that would be the last known contact with the patient. So we will again update this, you know, provide this clarity in the training manual and make sure that that carries on going forward in the next version upgrade. Next. A neonatal patient underwent a pacemaker procedure and ultimately died related to extreme prematurity. Do I still enter this case into the congenital heart surgery database? So this comes down, it's not a field, but really case eligibility. And the answer is yes. So even though neonatal pacemaker procedures are removed from the mortality analysis, we do want you to enter all operations into the database. So regardless of, of whether they would or would not be included in a specific component in the analysis. So yes, this patient upon analysis would be removed from the mortality analysis. And there are other exclusions um, to these rules as well. We still want you to include the case, but let the analysis work for you and remove these um, from the analysis. And you can refer to the analysis overview located in the IQBA library, and that will give you what exclusions, uh, the mortality exclusions for, for these cases. Next. Please explain the update made to the definition of the pre-op factor 360 hypocoagulable state secondary to medication. So as you know, we've had this long-standing historic definition that I'm not going to read to you, but it's really based on that you have lab evidence within 24 hours of entering the OR of this coagulopathy, and then you're on some kind of medication that we think is causing the, the coagulopathy. So last month, we added some clarity based on a very good question that was submitted by a data manager. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that we then added, in, it was in September, includes patients with the ongoing use of an anticoagulant medication, for example, Coumadin, with proven induction of a hypocoagulable state, and the medication was not held, discontinued, or changed prior to the surgical case. So next slide, let's explain what we meant by, by this sentence. So in general, it I got a lot of questions about this saying, so I don't need labs. No, that, that's not what we're saying. In general, the preoperative labs are a requirement for this preoperative factor, for you to code this preoperative factor for a patient. However, in the event a patient had labs drawn, let's say prior to the 24 hours, so maybe at the 48 hour mark, and it showed evidence of a hypocoagulable state, the labs were not redrawn, the medication that the patient was on, let's say in this case, Coumadin, was not changed, was not held, or was not discontinued prior to surgery, can you code this factor? And the answer now is, is yes. But this is a really specific scenario for you to look at. So you can think of examples of this. The case that came to us, to the core group, was actually a, a transplant case. So the patient came in and you know was on a, a an agent and um, had a hypocoagulable state shown by labs, but it was a few days before the transplant. They didn't know the patient was going to get a heart three days later, so they never did anything with the medications, and they never redrew the labs for, for whatever reason. Um, and so many of our programs probably would have already redrawn the labs, but this program did not. And, and so the patient clearly had evidence of a hypocoagulable state secondary to medication. It just wasn't in that 24-hour time frame. But with no change in the meds, there would be no reason why that hypocoagulable state didn't continue. So that is where we made this exception. So you still need labs by and large overwhelmingly unless you have the specific scenario where this comes up. And so you can think of this more along the lines of perhaps an emergent case that came in, transplant in this example um, really clarify this. So I hope I will try to rework and add some of this language into the training manual so it makes a little bit more sense. I think this was surprising and shocking to some, and without the background, I can completely understand. So I hope that now this helps and, and makes more sense to a very specific scenario that could happen in any of our programs, but it's probably not likely to happen 
a lot. Next slide. Can I code advanced maternal age as an other pregnancy complication? So if you go and look at this field, you will see that the definition states to include any other pregnancy related complication. So who defines other? So throughout the database, we have these other fields and you get to free text in those fields. Because it's free text, there, there's not rules around what you include there. So if you're, you know, advanced maternal age is likely a pregnancy related complication or at least a factor in um, a pregnancy and you want to write that in, go ahead and write that in. It's not audited. They're not analyzed. They're what we locally can use this data and say, this is what made this case maybe what we think a little more high risk or explains why we did certain things within the care of, of our patient. But most importantly, the reason these fields are there is because STS does review these. So at the time of the upgrade, we go through all of the other fields throughout the entire database, not just other pregnancy complication, but we look to see if additional fields should be included in the database. So we very much appreciate the free text that you, that you include because it helps us say, huh, I can't believe that's not in the list. We probably should add that. And especially if all of us have added you know, a, a certain finding or a, a certain field. And so this is where sometimes new things get added to pre-op factors or get added to the syndromes and, and NCAA fields and things. So please continue to use the other fields, but just know not audited, not analyzed. And other than adding any information you want that you think is related to a pregnancy complication, there's no formal definition for these fields. So yes, to this, to the person who asked about maternal age, you may absolutely add that in as other and then include it in the free text. Next slide. What time frame does STS define for post-op ECMO and really looking towards the post-cardiotomy ECMO? I've been asked this multiple times by my own surgeons. They don't like that, you know, maybe perhaps weeks after they've operated that the kid goes on ECMO and they're feeling it's not related to the surgery that the patient had, but perhaps related to ICU care or they got, you know, a horrible nosocomial infection in the cardiac ICU, and now we're going on ECMO, it has nothing to do with the repair they did. Correct. And remember, our complications are post-operative events that are describing a patient's post-operative course. And so when you think of it in those terms, did a patient go on ECMO during their episode of care following their index operation? Yes. So we're coding it. It is not ascribing blame to a bad repair to a surgeon or poor care in the ICU. We are really just collecting all applicable complications or post-op events. And most start in the intraoperative period through the episode of care. STS does not differentiate between post-cardiotomy ECMO and any other ECMO or timeframe of ECMO in the database. And so just remembering that the applicable timeframe for the collection of post-op events complications is the entire, you know, starting intraoperatively through the episode of care. Next slide. Patient was discharged to a chronic care center. Six weeks later, came in for an outpatient visit. The note states the patient recently discharged a home, but did not include the date specifically that the patient discharged a home. So what is the database discharge date? So this is a little tricky. Obviously, we want you to enter the date the patient discharged from the chronic care center. And, you know, you want an exact date. Not all of our records are going to contain this, especially if perhaps you have scanned in records from an outside doctor or facility and you don't really know that date. It just says recently in the last few weeks, in the last seven days, something along those lines. So in this scenario, it is you could answer the date the patient was seen for the outpatient visit. And that's probably the most specific date that you can come up with if there's not another date that is listed. And so I, I think that that's an absolute, you know, acceptable way because there is documentation that the patient did leave the care facility as noted in your physician note. It just may have been, you know, a few days earlier or a few weeks earlier, you don't know. Um, but at least, you know, as of today, the date of that outpatient visit, that the patient was discharged from that facility. Next slide. A patient that weighs less than two and a half kilos at the time of surgery undergoes a PDA ligation. During this admission, the patient then undergoes another cardiac surgery, this time with a higher stat score than the PDA ligation and ultimately expires. So is this a surgical mortality for my program? I get this question um, quite a bit. So let's talk a little bit about the mortality analysis and how it's assigned. 
So we know mortality, especially if we go and look at the um, analysis overview that is documented or published in the IQVIA library, that mortality is assigned to the index operation of the episode of care. So in this scenario, this patient underwent a, the primary procedure of a PDA closure surgical, and that is the index operation. The, because the patient weighs less than two and a half kilos at the time of this PDA closure, then they will be excluded from the mortality analysis. So that second operation that occurs that has a higher stat score or that the patient now weighs greater than three kilos or, or whatever, doesn't matter. This patient's index operation of the episode of care is the PDA closure surgical. And so therefore the patient is excluded from the mortality analysis. So the correct answer is no, this will not be a surgical mortality for your program. Next. My primary procedure and primary diagnosis don't match if I code the procedure with the highest stat score. So should I go back and update now the primary diagnosis? And I know this drives us all nuts and um, you want, you feel like your primary procedure should match your primary diagnosis, but this is not correct. And if you go back to the document that's posted on the STS web website, determination of primary diagnosis and primary procedure, you will see that there are two different ways that you get to the primary diagnosis and the primary procedure. So it makes sense that in some operations, they will not match. And so just remember your primary diagnosis is the primary reason the patient is undergoing the procedure that day. So sometimes it, there is one lesion, one finding that is leading, like we can we can wait no longer. The patient has to go to the OR today to have this repair. But ultimately during that repair, they repair something else, even planned or unplanned, you know, whatever. And that procedure may have a higher stat score or follow the rules differently and have an exception rule. And therefore a different procedure becomes primary. That is absolutely okay. They may not always match, but you wanna just follow the rules for determining your primary diagnosis as well as your primary procedure. Next slide. My surgeons perform many procedures on ECMO. How do I determine the operation type? So this is probably a, a type of question that we get into the core group numerous times per month. And I get it, they're tricky. I submit these myself to, to the core group. Um, so in general, when you do major structural repairs, when you're on ECMO or VAD support, the op type will be CPB cardiovascular. But as with all rules in the CHSD, um, there are always exceptions. So if the procedure is done to facilitate the ECMO or VAD circuit, then the op type will be ECMO or VAD. There are many, many examples of this in the training manual, but of course you read all of those and you think, but my scenario is still a little bit different than these and I wanna make sure that I'm doing this correctly. So go ahead, please continue to submit your specific scenarios as FAQs using the um, form on the STS website because these are tricky and I think they are difficult sometimes to elicit or you want to be able to explain to your surgeons without a doubt why this procedure was considered optype CPB cardiovascular, but that procedure was optype ECMO. They don't do this job every day. And so sometimes you, you, know, you need our email that comes back to you that says this will be optype this and therefore it will or won't be potentially a, a mortality in the database. So we understand and we want you to just continue to submit your scenarios um, if you feel like what's out there already or the guidance that you already have isn't adequate enough for your scenario. Next slide. Is cardiac arrest being included in the list of major complications? And do we now include those when answering the field patient died or had a major post-op complication? So this is field 4560, post-op complications. And the correct answer is not in this data version. And on that note, this field 4560 post-op comp is being removed in the upgrade version, so 6.23. So what you're hearing, if you've heard this or you heard this, um, I think it was said, um, by Dr. Subramanian in the in one of the recent calls. But along with the listed major complications, which you know those since you've been answering this question, this field of cardiac arrest has now been included in the audits. As well as in the version upgrade, we will collect, we are going to start separating the complications and you will collect some only during the hospital time frame, so that in your surgical hospital, the hospital that performed the operation, there will be certain complications that we follow just for that time period, and only the major complications and cardiac arrest will be 
um, followed for the entire episode of care. So when that patient leaves your hospital and you have a hospital discharge date and goes to another care facility, whether chronic or acute, then it's only going to be the major complications in, the, in addition to cardiac arrest that will be followed for the entire time frame. So that's coming with 6.23 education, um, but at least for now, Cardiac arrest, you're going to complete cardiac arrest as you would in your post-op complications, um, and but you don't need to include it then in the field post-op comp 4560. Next. Okay, I'm done. So yeah. looking forward to see all of you at, at AQO and in person, and um, I hope you're excited to watch the virtual um, platform starting tomorrow, as Leanne said. So yeah. thank you. Thanks, Chastity. Great. Um Great review. We appreciate it very much. Um, we don't have any new IQVIA updates. So if you've submitted a ticket or if you have any questions about a ticket that's been submitted, if you could, if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to put that into the Q&A um, and the IQVIA team can look into that, um, see if we can get a response for you um, while we're on. Um, but um, just know if you have submitted tickets, they are under review and um, will be fall and you will be, um, they'll be followed up with you um, as, as quickly as possible. Um, just a reminder, um, once the reports come out or if you have any questions about a previous report, um, please submit those questions directly to CHSD tech support at IQVIA.com. Um, and then, of course, STS and DCRI will be looped in as needed. Um, here's my contact information. Um, you can reach me directly via email or phone. If you have any database operational questions regarding payments, invoicing, participation, um, contacts, things like that, just reach out to us at stsdb at sts.org. Um, upcoming webinars, just mark your calendars. Our next user group call is scheduled for November 1st at 12 p.m. Central, um, followed by our November monthly webinar scheduled for November the 15th at 12 p.m. Central. Um, okay, um, that's all that, um, that Chastity and I have for today. Um, I do see we have, I'm going to leave this upcoming webinar slide here. We do have a couple of questions, Chastity. Um, so our first one, I can take this one. Um, what do you mean when you say that the harvest is underway? Is it submission? So um, we have an open submission, continuous submission process. So um, as soon as the snapshot was taken or taken for the um, 22 harvest, um, you could submit data for the 23 harvest immediately after you could, um, we just have a continuous um, submission process. So if you would like to um, begin submitting your cases for the um, spring 23 harvest, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, the data is currently being accepted and the data warehouse is open. Um, I can take this one. Yep. Hemo bags infused during the OR, where do you count this and cell saver reinfused or a different area? Um, Cassandra, I'm going to have you please submit that to the FAQ box so this can be discussed. It's not something that's been um, discussed before. So please go ahead and submit that and we'll get it then updated in the training manual. Perfect. Is there a time frame for long term follow update? There is not. And so um, it's essentially you can you're to use that field for any follow up that you do um, on your patient. So I know in my program specifically when we do longitudinal outcomes following say a you know HLHS repair or something like that, that's where I update the last time we know the patient's status uh, of alive or dead. And so there's not a do it at one year, five year, three year, you know anything like that. Um, but it's any time that you follow up. On your patient. Obviously, it would be great if everybody kept that up to date all the time, but understanding that <laughs> that that isn't feasible for all programs all the time. And, and so you just it's the last point of contact um, with your patient. And um, so you do the best you can with with updating that we update it, you know, every time the patient comes back in or if we see subsequent admissions, we try to update it there um, as well, just keeping that kind of longitudinal follow-up going, but you know in our upgrade, we're, we, we are currently collecting status at 365 days, and now we're also going to be adding, is it three-year and five-year follow-up as well? And so um, I know for me, if I don't have status at 365, but I have status at 363, I update the, the long-term follow-up field with, with that date since I don't, I'm my, it's unknown at 365 for me at this time. So you, you have a little bit of free reign there. Awesome. 
Thank you. All right. Um, has there been any official communication sent to sites about the changed version upgrade date? If not, will there be any sent? Um, so we can send a the official communication. Um, the vendors are aware. Um, vendors have been notified. They're actually going through the um, <clears throat> certification process. They've um, so that is underway. Um, but I believe, Krista, I'll, I'll make sure we work with marketing to get um, something out. And we'll also put information in the database news. So um, there will be plenty of communication that the go live date is, is July 1, 2023. Um, how do we access the virtual platform for AQO? Is a link sent to us or is it located on the registry website? So um, there will be an email um, that goes out tomorrow announcing the go live of the platform. So um, participants will receive an email tomorrow um, from um, marketing team. So that will be coming tomorrow. Uh, do you know how many new data fields will be added to the next version 623? Um, I do not have a count. Um, I know there are obviously with the addition of the adult um, the addition of the adults with congenital heart disease, that's a huge um, component. A lot of variables were added. Um, but know that if your patient's not 18 or over, um, you would not be answering all of those um, variables. So I, I don't have an exact count right now, Emily. But I know. Um, do I you just have, do you remember? A little bit. Um, so 281 fields were removed. Um, right. So that that's good. But many of what were removed came back in a in a different way. So maybe individual fields that were all yes, no were removed. Oh. And now it's one multi select, like select all that apply. And so, you know, perhaps 15 fields were removed and one new one was added. So it's really hard to do a, this many were removed and this many were added. I do know from the adult database, we brought over it's like 540 fields from the adult database. However, over 500 of those are specific to 18 and older. And so it's a very small number then that are brand new that we borrowed from or brought over from the adult side. And so it's, I, again, it's, it's difficult to exactly measure, but know that there were many fields that were retired, some that were revised, and then some new ones, of course, that were added. The biggest um, ads were to the adults. Thank you. Um, Jen, I, Jen, I just saw your com your um, question, comment, questions are not showing up so everyone can see them. Um, I'm sorry about that. I didn't realize I just changed the setting. Um, so I did not realize that that was not happening. So I apologize. Everyone should be able to see the questions. I'm not um, just trying to be just wanted to make sure I'm being transparent. Um, but I apologize. And you should be able to see all of the questions. So thank you, Jen, for letting me know. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Chastity um, and Emily. Cindy, why aren't billing and contract contacts available in the contact list report in the IQVIA platform? Um, Melanie, do you happen to know? I don't, I know you're, you're still on. I, that's more of a question for the database operations team. I'm not, Cindy, I'm not sure why they're not listed there. I just know that they are not available. Um, Melanie, do you happen to know why that was the case? I am not sure in regards to okay. I, they would have to um, they would have to give that feedback. I yeah. believe they were only certain roles that they um, the, the, had approved for required yeah. to show in that report. Yep, yeah. Cindy, if you want to email me directly or if you want to reach out to um, STSDB um, at STS.org, um, Jane and her team um, could answer that question, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you, but um, Jane and her team could answer that directly. Okay, cardiac arrest was added to our internal list of major complications. After it was stated, it will be added in a past webinar. Please explain how this post-op event should be captured now and in the version update again, please. So Michelle, um, obviously as a program internally, you can review any anything that you collect in your database or even outside of your database as a major complication. Um, we are, we're not updating the definition of did your patient die or have one of these listed major complications. Those listed major complications came over from a publication um, done by surgeons, some of which are on this call. And um, so that, that definition remains the same. Did your patient have one of these um, 
the the change comes that that field's going away did your patient die or have one of these major complications because if you're coding your complications you don't also need to come over to to that section and say yep i while i coded this over in complications now i also have to come over here and say yes that they had one of these STS knows they had one, your patient had one of these complications um, because you coded it correctly in the list of complications. So really to get rid of that du duplicative data entry where you're coding it under your complications and coming over into the that other section um, and coding it there, um, they got rid of that field and just said, continue to code as you would um, your complications. So for this version, code cardiac arrest exactly how you would otherwise code cardiac arrest. In the updated version, you're going to code cardiac arrest or collect cardiac arrest as you would, but just know um, right now all of your complications in this current version 3.41 should be collected through the entire episode of care. The update to 6.23 is that the listed major complications in addition to cardiac arrest will be followed through the episode of care. Everything else would all the other listed complications will be followed through the hospitalization at the surgical hospital. So, for example, your patient gets pneumonia after you transferred them to, you know, a hospital closer to home where they can feed and grow. You don't have because that's a complication that did not occur in your facility prior to hospital discharge. You don't code that when it happened at the other hospital. But if the patient experienced a cardiac arrest at the other hospital, a reoperation at the other hospital, um, anything, uh, uh, unplanned cardiac cath at the other hospital, those are all occurring within the patient's episode of care. So therefore they would be complications that you would collect for the um, episode of care. So this will all come out in the new training manual. And obviously we'll have lots of discussions between now and July 1 um, to explain this. But as far as the current field, did your patient die or have one of these major complications? We're not taking cardiac arrest into consideration for that question. You answer that question as it as it was come July 1 with the new version upgrade, you mm -hmm. will now include cardiac arrest as a major complication, but this field will be gone. Right. So I hope that helps, Michelle. Thank you, Chastity. All right. Um, I just um, wanted to pull over the um, website because um, just to give anyone another a few more moments to type in a question if you have anything, um, any additional questions. Um, for AQO, I'm 99.9% .9 certain there will be a link on the um, on the AQO page once everything does go live tomorrow, in addition to, um, you know, the marketing team reaching out announcing that um, the website is the link is live. So um, from the STS National Database um, homepage, if you just scroll down um, to advances in quality and outcomes, the data managers meeting, um, here is our AQO homepage with all information. Um, I'm like I said, 99.9% .9 positive. There will be a link on here tomorrow that will be active um, when the website does go live um, in addition to um, receiving communication from our marketing team. Um, again, if you have any questions regarding registration, um, you can scroll down and, and contact the meetings department here. If you have any questions regarding the program and um, continuing education, um, you can contact Emily directly via the link here and she could um, answer all those questions for you. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions come in. Um, all right, so I think we will end a little early, we'll give you guys back about 20 minutes of your day. Um, thank you everyone that joined, um, Chastity, Leslie, Dr. Meyer, um, Melanie, um, Jean, thank you um, for joining. And for those of you that will be in Rhode Island, we will see you um, next week. I look forward to seeing, um, seeing everyone in person. And of course, if you guys have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to reach out to me directly. And um, so with that, I hope you guys have a great uh, rest of the week and we'll see you guys in Rhode Island. Thanks everyone. I hope you guys have a great day.